Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today I'm going to be talking about instrumentation amplifiers. Even the name kind of sounds like what they do. In other words, these are not average amplifiers. They're not operational amplifiers. They're instrumentation. What's that mean? Well, that means they've got some qualities that we like when we're doing some more precise measurement or just measurement that actually takes a lot of gain. Uh, I'll tell you that these days I've got a kit of sensors like for Arduinos and stuff. Just tons of them in there. Almost all of those are conditioned to be read right into just a regular OA analog to digital converter with almost no other filtering. In other words, their output might be like a volt or something. But back in the before time, we had to do our own amplification. By the way, these work usually because they, they'll have a hybrid chip that sits there with the thermocouple, with the bar barometric pressure sensor, and gives you some of that gain and, and adds the linearity adjust for temperature. Uh, but you can do the amplification yourself it's straightforward if we're using the right chips. Let me show you an, uh, an instrumentation amplifier and a, a, a schematic and we'll see what we're talking about here. Here's a quick uh, schematic I grabbed that just shows an, op, an, a, an instrumentation amplifier standalone and it feeds into an analog to digital converter and this is a whetstone bridge. Uh, usually this is the form of a load sound. We're going to talk about those in a bit. Basically, this has to be so sensitive that this, these sensors move in microvolts, and so it's differential. We, we look for this signal go to a little high and this signal go a little low, and we take the difference of that, hence differential, and it's ready to go into an analog to digital converter. And we do some other things, like we, we bump it up so it's not hitting ground where the converter may have a problem. And it's pretty characteristic in a operational, or I mean in an instrumentation amplifier, that a gain setting resistor is not part of the chain like you're used to seeing with op amps. So let me talk about the qualities that make an instrumentation amplifier an instrumentation amplifier or at least desired to be an instrumentation amplifier. As, as I just showed it's differential it's got a, a an inverting and a non-inverting input and we get a lot of gain from that. Uh, we get noise cancellation we're going to talk about common mode rejection here in a second where the signal on both of them gets canceled out. It's got high impedance uh, it doesn't load the circuit down. If this thing is real tiny sensitive and you hang something on there and you feel it, all, what you're doing is you're measuring yourself, not, not the circuit itself, not the sensor itself. So it's high impedance. And not only is it high impedance on the inputs, the inputs are very close to being identical. We don't want one going, oh, I've got this and the other one kind of dragging differently. Um, you won't get a clean reading that way. So they're both high impedance. Uh, they're both pr fairly identical. And they both have low current inputs on most uh, uh, instrumentation amplifiers. That way, I mean microamps, picoamps. The reason for that is that you have less noise, less current density noise. You have less drift in temperature due to those currents. Uh, you have less nonlinearities because one's big, one's small because one was higher and one was lower. So it just makes for a better amplifier. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're after is a high gain amplifier with low drift. Now there's another kind of these. I'm not going to talk about them today here much, but they're called choppers and zero drift amplifiers. Uh, the the rep from um, linear technology don't call it chopper. Sorry, <laughs> zero drift. Um, but and 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 I'll show you we, when when that comes. We built one of those 20 25 years ago. Uh, here's how we build an operational amplifier back in the day. Nowadays you can do it in one chip. First, let me show you the difference between an operational amplifier that you may make yourself a uh, differential amplifier and an instrumentation amplifier and then let me show you how you can use operational amplifiers to build a differential uh, excuse me to build an instrumentation amplifier because again we used to build them in the old days uh, and and what we do is we take two or three op amps and we put them together that tries to create the qualities we want from a single instrumentation amplifier here is an op amp pick your most favorite op amp you like um, you can even have a JFET input and get some of the low noise, that kind of thing going, low, low bias current. But using this amplifier has issues that uh, make it by itself not quite what we want in, a, in an instrumentation amplifier. And let's start. The one thing we like, high impedance. We don't want this to load the circuit down. Well, I'll tell you that in a differential amplifier like this, where this feedback loop counters any voltage. Any voltage that appears here will be countered by here and the effective voltage here will be zero volts. That makes that a ground for all practical purposes which means if this is a hundred K ohms 
that the input impedance of this is 1,100 K ohms to ground. That's not very high. Sometimes these are less. Um, so right there we've got a, uh, the inverting input is typically not a high impedance input. And that's, that's great sometimes. Sometimes we want to mix signals together where they stop at ground first so they don't get mixed together, but not in this case. It's not what we want. On the uh, non-inverting input, um, we've got a path to ground here. So let's say this is 100K and this is 10K. Well, this resistance is also 110K, not what we want. And more, and just as importantly, these characteristics of this high impedance amplifier with no feedback versus this one with the feedback, they're not going to track each other. We, we do try and set these resistances to be equal so at least the temperature part of it doesn't like whack this amplifier all over the place. Uh, but a single differential amplifier is not an operational amplifier by itself in this configuration. And again, when we see our gain setting resistors right in the current flow, it, it gets messy. Here I've built I didn't build it. I, I I got this off the internet. But I could have easily drawn this schematic for an instrumentation amplifier. This is this is very standard. And what we see now is the input goes straight into the non-inverting input of an op amp. I could have built this with my favorite op amps, provided I could live with some of their issues. There's no resistor to ground. There's no gain setting. The only requirement is out here there has to be some kind of path to ground so that this gets biased. Okay, um, Electronics don't like to really float. They still like to have current flowing, even Pico amps. So that's the only requirement for this. But if we look on the other input, and one of these will be like the inverting input and one will be the non-inverting input. See? Yeah. Um, but they're both high impedance. They're both identical. If this if this amplifier is the same as this, then and this is low impedance or high impedance, then this is high impedance. We find our gain setting resistor in this case, and what they'll do inside a chip is they'll laser trim all of these so they're all nice and even. This current's equal to this current, and they bring out one single resistor for gain. So a lot of times this is the one you have access to. Sometimes it's programmable using uh, I squared C or SPI. Uh, sometimes it's just preset. Um, but by taking high impedance, high impedance, and then differentiate, differ, dif differentiating them and keeping our resistors nice and trimmed inside one single resistor, I'm on my way to making an instrumentation amplifier. I can get a gain of uh, 100. I can get a gain of 1,000. I've seen these with gains of 10,000. you got to get a lot more careful. Um, but we're on our way. I do want to show you in our bag of tricks department, you actually can build an instrumentation amp, fairly serviceable, um, using just two op amps. And again, look, here's our high impedance input, here's our high impedance input, and this gets negated, this gets inverted by f virtue it's fed to there. I haven't used this personally, and, and, and the, the only issues I would have with this is first you've got to get all this so it matches the gain of this exactly. It's not introducing its own temperature curves, its own errors. But I'll also say there's more delay from here to here. Um, it's going through, through an amplifier. Well, more delay is a pole. There's a low-pass filter going on. And if you were using this where common mode rejection ratios uh, and, and higher frequency, you know, ugh, just more to it by virtue this isn't really identical to this. But low frequencies, uh, non-critical applications, uh, knock yourself out. This is a dual package, so you can create an op amp, an, in an instrumentation amp, in one single package. Now, some of you that may know my background a little bit, uh, you know, before I designed uh, uh, computers for Commodore, which were mostly digital, except everything's analog, um, I, I did. Uh, I worked for a Pennsylvania scale company in Leola, Pennsylvania, and w we did some pretty uh, rad scales for the day. Very, uh, they were all processor controlled. They were uh, very precise. We made our own load cells, and we're going to talk about those in a second. So we had to have good analog electronics, we had to have good shielding, we had to have good production techniques uh, because of the kind of signal we were trying to amplify. And this is a good example here. A load cell, which is how a scale works, uh, is how strain gauge, how, how you measure the strain on a, uh, on a bridge or something you might, is a piece, is, is, is a uh, eight shaped piece of metal And we have strain gauges attached top and bottom. And when you apply a weight to this, this will flex 
And, and those little copper trails will get slightly longer and slightly shorter as, as we compress and, and, and ten, as, as we compress and elongate them. So we're trying to measure the change in resistance of a copper trace as it gets longer and shorter by m micromillimeters, okay? Um, and we're doing it, this is why I'm showing you here, we take 15 volts in, called the excitation voltage, and we might ground this end, and that means that right here in the middle, these act as resistor dividers, and these are the copper traces I was talking about called strain gauges, that this is typically 7.5 volts, and this is typically 7.5 volts, and that little itty bitty change is riding on top of that 7.5 volts. It's a whisper in a hurricane, all right? The thing that they have in common is it's the same 7.5 volts here, so it, it takes this huge signal with a little bit here and this thing takes a huge signal with just the opposite little bit there and it cancels out the seven and a half volts so well that what we get is that whisper in a hurricane times a thousand times ten thousand times whatever gain we wanted um, so this is called the common mode rejection ratio cmmr it's the ratio of how much the seven and a half volts i can cancel out while still doing a good job of this signal right here. Now, a lot of times, uh, the if you look at like signal and noise ratios and stuff like that, you think, oh, 60, 80 dB, that's pretty good for, you know, 8-bit converter or something like that. Well, if you do the math involved with canceling out that big of 7.5 volts to this micro, these things end up having to have CMMRs um, or CMRRs, uh, you know, 100, 120 dB, you know, so, so it's a different scale that we need this common mode rejection to work for us to pick out that little bit. But this is uh, this is how a scale works. And I actually have a strain gauge I'm going to show you here. Um, in the old days, we have to hand build them and cook them and do all kinds of things. These days, you buy them from, uh, you get them on eBay for $7, and that's what I did. Now, the part I'm about to show you today is an analog device is 8222. It's a low drift implementa uh, instrumentation amplifier. Um, before I jump into that, I want to tell you in the old days, when we designed things like this, you're going to find one company in particular on, on here, and that's Precision Monolithics, PMI. This is my data book from 1990. Oh, big, fat, only about precision. These, I mean, these guys knew it, right? And we lived through the early days of popcorn noise on the OP01 and stuff. So this is used as something called an OP07 building block, uh, and we used to even use our own external match transistors to emulate the front end of an instrumentation amp. These guys sorry to say, uh, are no longer with us. Uh, they got bought out by analog devices, so I guess it's uh, not a coincidence that here I am sitting on an AD device today. So uh, let me show you the, the evaluation board for that. Uh, for part two, I actually have my own PCB, hopefully shows up in time. We're going to do a zero drift version of it, where in, in theory I should be able to hit it with a heat gun and have it still work. So let me show you this evaluation. So here's the evaluation board for the AD8222. Actually, oh, there it is. And uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You, you can get one of these, uh, you know, without a lot of dollars. Uh, if you want to try it without actually cutting it, your own PC, uh, you do see its surface mount. And here is our load cell. And you can see uh, that H shape I was talking about, the, 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 the strain gauges are here and here. And in fact, I normally wouldn't handle one if I was in production and this was real. Um, just the amount of, of damage I'm probably doing if I were to bang it, it'll remember those stresses. But hey, this is just a video and this was just something I got off eBay. So I've got my three voltages coming in. I do tend to twist my wires whenever I'm doing something like that. But with that said, we're going to see some noise later when we, because all these wires hang in the air. And uh, let's go ahead and apply power and see what this thing looks like. Finally, here we are. Uh, if you can hear the background noise, none of my test equipment is quiet. It all has fan noise. And uh, so we've got power applied. We've got our Keithley voltmeter attached. And I've got my new Tech MDO scope attached. And uh, here's the load cell. And just by pushing down on it, you can see the deflection on both the scope and the Keithley. Um, you will note the noise, and the scope makes it apparent. The Keithley kind of filters it a little bit. Uh, that's from we've got wires hanging up in the air. If we look at the schematic, there's room here for RF filtering that's not in here. So this high impedance 
extreme gain amplifier is amplifying everything around it. And and I could literally do a uh, an episode on just quieting down that because I know I can quiet that down to a nice single. Again, it's what I used to do, but it still sometimes is amazing that all I'm doing is I'm barely, barely, barely stretching some copper, and and right there I just overflowed the meter in that range. Uh, probably broke the strain gauge too. Um, so this is an instrumentation amplifier at work. Um, and if you can get these kind of uh, readings now out of something like this, then you can go ahead and pump that into your AVR, your Arduino, your PIC, uh, whatever you've got going. So you, you won't always get uh, the sensor that happens to be compatible with today's uh, hobbyist and, and home processors. But the only downside, I'd say, to instrumentation amplifiers is uh, they they have moved to be in surface mount and they were always layout uh, sensitive. And in fact, if we do a thing on nice, I'll show you how you do guard rings and stuff around. I mean, these high impedance, just think of it as an amplifier all its own, right? Um, there are ways you can buy the boards pre-made. I'll probably, I've, here's a differential amp I've got. Um, I'm waiting on an instrumentation amp to come back uh, and maybe that'll be in part two where it's already mounted and everything. Um, and then like there are other boards, let me show you this one. This is a TI part, who of course absorbed national, um, and and I just happened to grab this in case one didn't work. I was going to use the other, and right here you can see the schematic for the RF filtering uh, that I was talking about on the other one, where the other one wasn't stuffed for that. So, um, and again, we I'm, I plan on putting something like into a footprint like that. Hopefully this helps, uh, helps you identify uh, what an instrumentation amplifier is, uh, what makes it different than a regular amplifier, and when you might actually need one. Uh, and there's just volumes. I mean, if, if you get books this thick about the subject, then I'm not lying when I say there's volumes of, of, of data about this topic. When it comes to picking out the signal from amongst the noise, a lot of times you can do it by, by doing a dot in your eyes and picking the right part. So again, Bill Heard from Hackaday, hoping uh, this introduction to instrumentation amplifiers whets your appetite for a little analog. Maybe we'll do some more digital here in the future, get off the analog, but for now, Bill Heard from Hackaday, uh, come on back.